Well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this is the second, or well, there's a series of events we've had related to the book, uh, Neo-Nationalism. And oh, I got my thing is <laughs> fading it in and out. Uh, Neo-Nationalism and Universities, uh, uh, Populist Autocrats and the Future of Higher Ed. And in that book, uh, there's a series of case studies that, uh, that are done uh, uh, with uh, co-authors or, or authors of chapters. And they range you know, from uh, a selection that includes, uh, of course, the United States and the UK, uh, also parts of Europe, Hungary and Poland, uh, movements and what are the impacts in the EU by having new nationalists at the kind of the periphery of the EU, EU Turkey, Russia, China, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Brazil as well, get one southern southern hemisphere uh, uh, nation in the in the mix. In any case, the, today's event is to focus on uh, on the uh, on the chapters uh, and the authors that uh, wrote them on China, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, and Russia, and it's kind of a mix. But we decided that that was a good way to do it. Um, and so, uh, you know, I want to say how much I appreciate the authors of those chapters being here. I want to also note that uh, we have co-sponsors uh, for this event by University World News and here on the Berkeley campus, uh, the Institute of East Asian Studies and also the Institute of European Studies. Um, I should say I am John Douglas here at uh, the Center for Studies in Higher Ed and kind of the person who corralled the book <laughs> together. Um, on the format, uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to say a few things about the book, the, uh, a little bit more about the book, and then um, uh, we'll uh, have each of our uh, presenters talk briefly about their case studies, some of the major themes, uh, maybe 15 minutes or so around that. And then we'll go to questions and discussions. And I have some questions and some have come in, in through the RSVP list and also uh, um, uh, we'll look, take a look as, as we're going on. So you should submit questions. We'll see how many we get to. It's only an hour. Uh, so that's uh, a challenge, shall we say that? Because there's a lot going on in these countries, let alone other parts of the world. So uh, this book uh, was long in the making. We had a conference back in 2017 here on the Berkeley campus that I organized with a, some funding from the Carnegie Corporation. And that evolved to say, well, let's, let's really you know, do a publication related to it. I'm a big believer in case studies to really try to understand these events uh, in the world, what is going on with nationalism and uh, populist movements. In the book itself, I uh, based partly on the uh, chapters, but also my own you know, research and investigation, provide a kind of a framework uh, to help at least kind of try to understand what is going on in the world, understanding also that our case studies can only do, you can only do so many case studies in a book. Uh, there are so many others that we could have included. I always like to joke that we could have included North Korea, uh, North Korea, sorry, North Korea, but uh, we, nobody would know anything about what's going on in North Korea. So that would have been a challenge, but there's just so much, there's a significant, uh, um, you know, uh, global movement of autocrats and they keep evolving. There are some cracks in the armor. We're seeing a little bit uh, in, uh, in the EU and Hungary and Poland, some, and also the, you know, losing some seats to the AFD in Germany. We're seeing some shifts going on uh, in parts of Europe. We'll see how that uh, emerges, <clears throat> but generally uh, autocrats are on the march. So in the book, I try to unpack this. Like, uh, how can I, you know, provide some kind of simple way of looking at this? And I uh, do a spectrum, I offer a spectrum of different kinds of new nationalist movements from uh, <clears throat> yeah, new nationalist uh, uh, movements, uh, nascent, shall we say, to political parties that are actively new nationalist. And this is defined in various ways, which we won't get in totally into right now. But, <clears throat> and then you go to actually nationalist leading governments. And, you know, I could think at the edge of that could be, you know, at one point, Britain with Brexit, uh, uh, Trump, uh, Trump's uh, presidency in the US, but there's a lot of nuance to these things. So I don't mean to over overly simplify, but, and then to illiberal democracies, uh, which we see, you know, in a Hungary and a Poland, 
uh, or Poland's moving towards that. Turkey is a, a mix of these things as well uh, to an auto, truly autocratic governments. Uh, and, you know, I think uh, we can now include China in that. Although again, there's nuance in that and it's complicated. And that's why we have the case studies. Um, so I also talk about, well, what are the impacts within this range? And they really are a big range of things that are going on from a very anti-immigrant nativist approach that you find you know, in most new nationalist movements, not all, <laughs> but also a golden age myth, sometimes related to religion. Um, and then I say, well, what, what are the real accelerants to this? I think in the modern era, globalization has created a lot of economic uh, 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 unpredictability for people. Uh, we also have uh, the use of technology and artificial intelligence, for example, in China, uh, that is, and, and uh, different paths for social media and then demographic change. Again, that also varies. Uh, it's not quite the same in China or Russia, but uh, you see the impacts of that in Europe and in the United States to some degree. Uh, so I talk about various impacts that you see and we'll get into some of those uh, with, our, with our presenters. And I also present a conceptual idea of, well, when are universities leaders or followers in the societies they serve? And I kind of, this messaging is uh, geopolitical geography, <laughs> still matters, you know, it, it, uh, there's, there are really significant aspects that are different from nation to nation similarities, but also that historical cultural relationship, political relationship really drives what universities can do or not do. So with that, uh, I do want to briefly introduce our uh, speakers. Karen Fisher is a, a, a well-known journalist in higher education, writes often for the Chronicle of Higher Ed, and also produces the newsletter Latitudes. I think you're aware of that. Igor Cherikov is uh, the director here at my center, at our center uh, for studies in higher ed at UC Berkeley. He's the director of what we call the Student Experience and the Research University Consortium and a researcher who writes broadly about not only uh, the student experience, but Russia and other places, uh, global impacts of rankings, things of that nature. And then Brian Penbrass, who is, I always get your title slightly wrong, uh, is the vice president, right? Uh, you are- uh, I can- well, Your vice, vice president, president of sponsored research. research. Uh, and I mean, also a, a professor of science at Soka University. And he's also was deeply engaged in the development of the uh, Yale NUS college. And uh, so uh, he's written a chapter with me on Hong Kong and Singapore, and he has a lot of experience in those areas. So anyway, I'm very grateful to have you here. Uh, now, as I said, we would go briefly to each of you <clears throat> to talk a bit about some of the themes in, in, your, in your book. And I think what we'll do is let's start uh, with uh, Karen and, and China. Um, uh, thanks, John, and, and it's great to, to be here with Igor and Brian as well, and with all of you. Um, let me just talk very briefly because I know we do have a lot of questions already, um, but I think there are a couple of, of themes um, in terms of China and Chinese universities and uh, nationalism that I tried to hit on. One is that it's very much um, a constant, if not constant, a routine um, factor in kind of modern, the, the evolution of modern Chinese higher education. You have these kind of waves of, of neo-nationalism. You also have universities um, really helping shape um, kind of modern China and what it will look like. And you have an over time sort of leaders who see the, the critical role of universities in what they, their aspirations for China. Um, and in the past, you, I, wave might not be the right thing, but you, you have kind of this, this ongoing tension with um, sort of the, the assertion of, of maybe more nationalistic um, uh, and more ideological tendencies. And then you have kind of an opening up and then a closing and opening up. Right now, I think one of the most interesting things about the current moment is, is you have kind of two things happening at the same time. And there's a real tension between that. Whereas, you know, obviously Xi Jinping is one of the most sort of nationalistic um, leaders that China has seen in, in some time and has sought to put a real ideological stamp on Chinese higher education and been very wary of um, 
you know, some of these, these competing ideas, um, such as Western, Western thought, um, to the sort of his sort of brand of communist um, party ideology. At the same time, we're talking about a leader who very much sees knowledge and innovation as kind of central to his image of modern China, of, of the China as a 21st century um, superpower. And so how do those things coexist? Not easily. And so I think one of the things I have that's a real question is what does this look like in the future? Uh, the other key factor, and I think we'll probably hear about this um, from some of the other speakers as well, is, is the critical force of, as you pointed out, John, of globalization and internationalization, particularly when it comes to higher education. And so it's not just that, um, that she wants Chinese universities to be good and, or great on their own terms, but to be world class and to be um, the Chinese higher education system and Chinese um, faculty and Chinese researchers and Chinese students are very integrated into this global system of higher education. And so how does that then further complicate these, these sort of tensions between um, ideological um, sort of adherence and innovation? And so um, I think it's a real balancing act. And I think there are a ton of questions um, you know, as we wrote this book, John said that we have been working on it for a long time. And it was just, we could have revised, I could have revised my chapter on China forever because I feel like it's a, a real moving target. And I'm sure if we had this conversation six months mm -hmm. from now, I might say something entirely different. Anyway, thanks, John. Uh, yeah, no, China is an imp incredibly important case study. And it's like, where is it going? And it does bleed into our next uh, discussion, Hong Kong and Singapore. So uh, Brian, um, maybe you could uh, take the stage. Right, okay, thank you. Um, happy to be with everyone here and being part of this project, which I think is so important for clarifying uh, some of the complexities that arise in these situations where uh, academic freedom, cultural issues, uh, and national ambitions, academic cultures are all colliding. And I think that's nowhere more true than in the case of Singapore and Hong Kong, which we frame as sort of two island nations uh, in the shadow of China. And in one case, that shadow has turned into darkness in the case of Hong Kong. And in the case of Singapore, it's more indirect, the influence of China. Uh, and in both of the case studies, we look at the, the ways in which academic freedom in Hong Kong and China have been shaped both by these external factors that would be, in the case of Hong Kong, the rise of Xi Jinping and his uh, increasing control and, and increasingly totalitarian approach to governing and how that had infiltrated into all aspects of the Hong Kong academic system uh, in subtle ways first, and then uh, over time, uh, more uh, rapidly uh, unraveling uh, academic freedom and other arrangements that were in some ways uh, inherited from the British colonial period. And Singapore uh, in, provides an excellent sort of pairing to Hong Kong in that they also are not only in the shadow of China, but in the shadow of, of Britain. And so in both cases of Hong Kong and Singapore, we have what amounts to a British colonial system being taken over by a, a local uh, local authorities and and in both cases also having international global uh, ambitions in which the university would play a key role a strategic role in launching the economy of both hong kong and singapore but very different approaches in both cases to how academic freedom uh, influx of foreign workers both at, at lower uh, socioeconomic levels and also at the highest tiers of creative and cultural levels are played out in Singapore. Uh, in both cases, Hong Kong and Singapore are about the same size. Hong Kong has about 7.4 million, Sing Singapore about 5.8 million. Um, in, in both cases, um, they are dependent on that, that interaction with the outside world for their dynamic economy. And so the university system plays a key role in that. In the case of Hong Kong, the protests, the umbrella protests and, and others began to create initial cracks in the university system as university leaders were not able to really support protesters in fear of retribution. And then additional pressures came on 
in the way in which the governing systems of the universities in Hong Kong became increasingly controlling of the universities, in some cases reversing appointments and promotions, in other cases dictating particular policies. Uh, in the case of Singapore, uh, you can think of Singapore as an illiberal, uh, illiberal democracy. Uh, that's one way of putting it. Certainly calling it totalitarian is missing the mark. And this is something I was involved in helping start the Yale and US College. I spent a year at Yale helping design the curriculum and three years living in Singapore as part of the founding group of Yale and US College. And I would hear a lot of critics talking about it as a, a totalitarian state, which completely really misses the mark. I think if you look at Singapore, it's, it's, its rise, which has been incredibly dramatic, has been based on a system of open and welcoming embrace of foreign talent throughout its growth and rise as a global power economically. And so key to that is the, the university system, which would embrace foreign talent. What really happened in Singapore, and this includes the Yale and US College, is something of a backlash against what um, you, you might cons consider as a Singapore first movement without really sort of casting uh, Trump-like uh, energies onto it. But it's, it's a recognition of the need for Singapore to strategically focus on its own population and, and developing that population fully. And so one event that happened in Singapore that was super important was a decline in work passes for foreign workers. Uh, this is a reversal of, of a policy that started around 2002 when Singapore wanted to become a, a global higher education hub, they called it the global schoolhouse. It, there, there are quotes in the book chapter about how Singapore wanted to be uh, the Boston of the East. They wanted to be an oasis of talent, a knowledge hub. Uh, and this open door policy was incredibly generous at the beginning of the 2000s. And then gradually, as, as the universities rose in stature and rankings, as Singapore began to feel uh, more self-sufficient in some ways in its academic uh, enterprise, it began to kind of roll back uh, or roll up the welcome mat. Uh, and so after about two th 2015, the number of uh, foreign visas that were given began to uh, decrease. University of Chicago uh, actually withdrew from one of its uh, operations in Singapore. Uh, other institutions were a bit under stress by the tension between bringing in uh, international students and providing some scholarship aid for them versus the need for Singaporean uh, students. And that tension was nowhere more evident at Yale and US College, which featured about half Singaporean students and half yeah. Singaporean. So, so, let me just break in here, Briggs, because I wanna keep going and then we'll come back because I think we wanna have some discussion, both Karen sure, and, sure. and uh, Brian have, have written about uh, the uh, uh, end of the Yale and US College. Uh, yeah. project, which is extremely uh, in the news and important. But one yeah. thing I wanted to just know before going to Igor is that, and you note this, uh, is this uh, process that we've seen among autocrats, if we look across the board of the case examples we have, uh, or autocrat leading governments, <laughs> whatever, is greater control of the governance and management of universities. And there's been a kind of a systematic approach to this. Uh, whether it's uh, in, in China or Hong Kong or Turkey or Hungary, we see this over and over, or, and Russia uh, as well. And so uh, uh, I wanted to go to Igor because, Igor, that's at least one of the themes that you discuss in the book in, uh, about Russia. So, Igor. Yeah, thank you, John. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, this book has finally come out. Uh, and thanks to you and all the collaborators for <laughs> making it happen. It's, uh, it's been a long road after, after a conference that CSHG hosted, uh, was it four years ago, right? Almost four years ago. Uh, so um, uh, we worked on this, um, on this chapter on Russia together with uh, my co-author, uh, Igor Fidukin. And um, it has been very exciting to kind of to discuss the impact of Putin's regime on universities. And I, I share uh, Karen's feeling totally. For us, the main challenge was that, you know, to keep up <laughs> with various and mostly worrisome events, uh, you know, in Russia that unfolded once we submitted the first draft of this chapter um, a couple of years ago. So uh, we have honestly felt that this is, this is the, a moving target. 
So um, I'm, I'm pretty sure other collaborators uh, feel the same way. So um, in our chapter, we have explored how Russia's version of neo-nationalism influenced the um, uh, behavior and status of, of Russian universities. And the main difficulty we had, um, aside from kind of a following uh, new developments, is how to distinguish between um, on one hand, on the one hand, uh, resurrection of Soviet legacies uh, of control of higher education, which is very influential in Russia, uh, uh, then some basic generic authoritarian practices that they borrow from each other and in many autocracies share with each other. And also like the ones that uh, specifically associated with neo-nationalism. And um, in some countries, like in Western countries, it's easy to attribute certain development to neo-nationalism, like especially in Western countries, um, when, for example, politicians are like cracking down on international students attacking like liberal bias in the universities. And um, for Russia and other autocratic regimes, uh, they kind of for a long time sought to limit academic freedoms, to police international contacts, uh, mobility, to impose nativist agenda. So with that in mind, with that kind of a distinction in mind, we explore the tensions that Russia had between various, this various policy objectives uh, in higher education. And, and the main tension we ob observe is between on one hand, like modernization agenda uh, and uh, on, one, on, on the one hand and ideological and, and political control by the state. So um, we also kind of explore the meaning of this ongoing re of higher education uh, when elements of Soviet higher education system abandoned in, in the nineties of being kind of a reinstall and uh, brought back to life. And obviously, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the very financial difficulties will, will, prob will probably re just reinforce the power of the state. So, uh, but in general, Russian universities like over the past two decades experienced like increasing political pressures. It was like a steady growth. And uh, this included, for example, like reduction of university autonomy, faculty autonomy, uh, efforts to uh, police academic speech, international contacts. Uh, there are numerous examples of uh, firings uh, of politically outspoken faculty members, um, basically using universities as instrumental places to police student activism as well. And just some few developments, some few very recent developments that are not in the book. Um, and um, for example, an arrest of editors of student newspaper DOXA that became kind of the main voice to protect student rights. And even last week, um, uh, a rector of Moscow School of Social and Economic Sciences, a Russian British kind of a private university, Sergei Zuev was arrested and there are other cases and it's hard to keep up. Um, in, um, in Russia, kind of a, uh, after a short period of liberalization in the 90s, the government kind of found new pathways to limit the civil liberties and, and place, you know, these controls on the university. And um, what's puzzling, you know, for that for, for us, that for at least a decade, this trend of kind of a uh, cracking down on the universities, on academic freedoms, coexisted with kind of a efforts to modernize Russian higher education, Russian universities, according to like various best international practices, right? And, and how like, um, it's interesting to observe how in Russia, the, the, the drive to make universities more transparent, more effective, international, was also used as a path to impose this kind of a greater controls over institutions and their faculty and their students. So it's, um, uh, an interesting and uh, a little bit sad example of that. And finally, just my concluding remark is uh, an important feature of Russian case, and, and maybe to some extent Chinese case as well, is that um, this neo-nationalism rhetoric, uh, it often takes the form of resurrecting and, and reinventing, reinstalling Soviet rhetoric. And uh, what's in, in the literature is called re-Sovietization, right, in, of different of different sectors, including higher education. And um, um, in Russia, the new nationalism is built not so much about reference to kind of pre-Soviet pre era, but 
rather, you know, around the Soviet victory in World War II, increasingly like Stalin himself. And, and the symbolic Sovietization kind of a, is, um, is, is found in, in, many, in many policies and institutional design of, of Russian universities. So that, in a nutshell, our contribution. So both in the China and, um, and Russian examples, there are, is this sense of a reassert, you know, after a period of relaxation of opening of markets in China, for example, or a, a controlled opening of markets and civil liberties, that that has been withdrawn as time has gone on uh, and as both Putin and Xi have uh, consolidated their power. Um, so, you know, how much, uh, you know, these are revivals, uh, yes, but there are also nuances and new ways in which they're going about it. And I think China is just really a, a significant player in kind of paving the way for other autocratic governments uh, in part through the social credit score. Use of, so the, the universities operate in this larger uh, political world in which uh, civil liberties are being uh, changed uh, or and reduced. And so anyway, I think that's... Uh, that larger political world is really quite uh, a significant player in it. And then you see that also in other parts of the world. But so let me uh, ask you I, uh, this general question and I go to Karen first and that is, well, what is the state of academic freedom in China? And then I'd ask the same thing of Russia and then I'd ask the same thing. Let's uh, talk about Hong Kong perhaps in particular. Um, sure, I mean, that's, that's a I think the state is, is, is unhealthy, the patient's not doing well. Um, I mean, part of the, the issue is, as you say, there were periods, I think, um, in which higher education was seen as having, be, having um, even within a sort of liberalizing economy, liberalizing market, um, higher ed was sort of, Citadel may be a strong word, but there, there was, it was, you know, I think researchers and academics for a period felt that they had more latitude. And I think that is definitely circumscribed now. I think some of the, the um, pressures on academic freedom have become um, less subtle and, um, uh, you know, the red lines um, used to, it used to be a, okay, we know that there are these, you know, handful of topics that if you, you sort of get into them, you'll be tripping um, uh, sort of, you know, pushback and, and scrutiny. And now um, I think people are, are less and less sure of where those red lines are. Um, we are seeing this in a number of ways, some of which echo things that um, both Igor and Brian have said, you know, we're seeing um, uh, crackdowns on student activism. We're seeing, um, so it's kind of the, the watchful eye um, in the classroom. And so there's this sense of who knows who is, you know, is watching you. Um, we, so we've seen um, professors suspended and sometimes fired, some of them quite prominent um, for making political statements um, inside and outside the classroom. Um, we are seeing, um, you know, in the, the broader crackdown, um, in Xinjiang and against the Uyghurs, we're seeing um, academics in particular um, being a, a target um, of, of those that repression. Um, we're seeing, you know, we get into the international space, we're seeing censorship of, of journals. Indeed, some international journals um, have, you know, what they are able to publish in China or make available to their Chinese readers are, um, is less, and then you're seeing kind of this push around what's being taught and what's the curriculum and what, where, um, you know, how much of it is Chinese and sort of ideologically consistent, and how much of it is, it is um, influenced by the greater internationalization of Chinese higher education. And then finally, I think um, particularly um, troubling to to a number of people is the. Um, rewriting um, or changing of university charters, including of some very prominent universities that had enshrined academic freedom and they removed those references. And so what kind of, I mean, what sort of signal does that send um, institutionally into to the world? Yes, I know that one uh, change in the, uh, you know, the nationally derived uh, system of uh, faculty advancement was to include uh, pro-Chinese uh, 
journal articles as uh, part as opposed to say something that is heavily cited uh, in an index score of some sort is <laughs> a pathway to greater uh, financial rewards for faculty. So it's very pervasive. And then also, you know, I, you talk about some of this, but it bleeds into what uh, Xi is trying to do in other parts of the world. Uh, he's also, or, or at least the Communist Party seems to be monitoring what people are saying about China in other parts of the world and uh, using student associations to protest or do these other things. So this is this uh, other kind of aspect of it. Well, what about, uh, uh, Russia, what's what's going on with academic freedom in Russia? Uh, my sense is it's, it has elements like China, but it's not as pervasive. It's still, but it's significant. Yeah, um, I would say like in short, is the same thing as as Karen described exactly that. And um, like if if Karen characterized China as kind of unhealthy, I would probably uh, use a, a a stronger metaphor like uh, ER. In terms of uh, in terms of Russia, so it's like almost almost near death, but at the same time, Russia never had a tradition. Like Soviet Union never had a tradition of academic freedom and protecting academic freedom. There were no inst institutional safeguards in place, and they were not developed during the nineties and and two thousands. Uh, once you know, it was just a period where um, I guess in general state didn't care had other you know, priorities, responsibilities. And once, you know, Putin um, re-established, you can establish its, its power, uh, then, you know, uh, this crackdown happened. And I think the year uh, is 2014 when, you know, all this, this actually accelerated. Uh, there were signs of it before 2014 when uh, after kind of the annexation of Crimea, but um, uh, it, it, it was after 2014 when, when it all accelerated. And uh, same, I, I guess there are the same kind of measures as well, just firings of faculty, um, you know, cracking down on student activists and, um, and that's, that's how it works. There are also like legal environment is changing uh, very quickly. There are new laws introduced that are very restrictive and uh, uh, they are very selectively enforced. So you never know if things you are doing like will be prosecuted or not. And this is some get prosecuted, some are not. And this kind of creates this atmosphere of fear in general and uh, self-censorship and universities are trying to distance themselves from their faculty just introduce like clause in the in the um, um, when they uh, in the employment during the employment that you know when you uh, um, give a comment to a media or when you um, uh, give a public speech please don't affiliate yourself with the university like you're not not please don't affiliate you're not allowed to affiliate with the university so that kind of a, to protect at least institutions from uh, from that but yeah in general it's not you know, do well and it's um um uh it's worse the conditions for for academic freedom are worsening um also the COVID 19 pandemic I, I think just only only accelerated this this type of uh uh movement and one of the reasons why in russia like universities and, and elsewhere i guess universities are like are opposed to uh, like digital technologies in their teaching, like using more digital technology in their teaching because it allows, you know, uh, anyone to observe what's going on in, in, every, in every classroom and, uh, and use that against, against faculty. Yeah, the use of technology, which again, China is really leading the way in artificial intelligence for, you know, using it from everything from, uh, you know, uh, facial recognition to uh, monitoring whatever you're writing. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a significant part of, I think, uh, the autocratic playbook as one has put out. Uh, and uh, so uh, Hong Kong, you know, also has this uh, merging, it appears. We're seeing a dissolution of the uh, uh, one China, two systems uh, structure, it appears. And so we're where is the status of academic freedom in Hong Kong now, and where do you think it's going? Um, yeah, it's um, just like the one, um, the two systems idea, as we say in the chapter, it unraveled at first slowly and then quickly. And I think academic freedom likewise is 
uh, it had been creeping uh, away from from the sort of vibrant freedom that that Hong Kong had, you know, for much of the beginning of the 2000s. But as the uh, city administrator in Hong Kong controls the universities, the board uh, that reports to the city administrator was becoming increasingly stocked with loyalists from the mainland and other sort of kind of subtle techniques, which began uh, early on, like maybe about five years ago, began to accelerate. So people who reached mandatory retirement age were no longer being allowed to continue working various uh, mid-level uh, positions were now being populated by mainland Chinese academics who were preferentially hired over a course of a decade. And so there's just been an increasing uh, grip of control over the academic enterprise. And now, of course, now that the system is completely clamped down uh, on uh, basically, you know, all the different ways of imprisoning dissonance now that exists in Hong Kong, uh, you could say the patient is definitely if not uh, kind of uh, in the ICU, it's definitely, uh, it's on a ventilator right now to use COVID terminology. So Hong Kong has you know, been known to have very high quality institutions and they've built some new ones in the last three decades, uh, science and technology focused. And uh, so uh, are we seeing an exodus of uh, faculty? Are they looking to get out or, and this is a, a cultural background with the British and, uh, and a British yeah. higher ed system influence that's kind of used to uh, more liberal forms of, of government. Uh, so what, are we seeing yeah. an exodus? I, yeah, I mean, definitely. And I, I think it, it's only just now starting and will begin to accelerate. I think people have been sort of stunned by the pace of the rollback of freedoms in Hong Kong. And, and so certainly that will accelerate. And I think it also illustrates really how counterproductive these strategies are, because if indeed, as it is the case in Hong Kong and Singapore, the top flight universities are essential for economic growth and, and the long term health of the economy, doing this sort of clampdown and, and removing a lot of the foreign talent in those institutions will only erode their quality and only degrade the economy that, that they're trying to build. So I think you know, the Chinese authorities really need to, have to think about whether it's possible to find some kind of equilibrium point where they can retain some semblance of the excellence that those universities were, were building and, and have at the moment. Well, let's, I've got a number of questions and we've had them about the NUS, Yale, hmm. the Yale NUS college and what happened and uh, both Brian and Karen have written about it. Let me go to you first, Brian, since you were on the faculty there and in an administrative position, what happened? And, and for those who don't know, uh, if you're not aware, uh, this was a collaboration between a branch campus uh, college uh, that was uh, between Yale and NUS, and it was a liberal arts college and uh, uh, model and was very successful at bringing in talent from other parts of the world. Uh, but then uh, it uh, has been ended in the college has been absorbed in a certain kind of way I don't completely understand yet into yep. the NUS and away and Yale is no longer a partner. Sorry, long intro, but go ahead. So what happened? Right. Um, so just the facts. I mean, it was a unilateral based, based decision of the Singaporeans that through NUS and not really outside of NUS, there has not been an identified sort of party that that really sort of were, was urging the, the closure. It, it appears to be that the president of NUS, as part of his reforms of NUS, decided it would be better to actually take control of Yale NUS, which was working as an autonomous unit within the NUS campus and merge it with what's called the University Scholars Program. Uh, that process then would remove uh, autonomy, remove faculty governance, and, and basically absorb the various faculty members into the much larger and much more tightly controlled uh, NUS. What I like to say, and I actually used, I wasn't planning this, but I happened to carry my lunch in in this uh, beautiful Yale NUS uh, bag. And we had this tree as kind of a metaphor of our Yale NUS. It was growing and it's spreading branches. And basically a chainsaw was taken to that tree. And it no longer, um, I think, and this is me maybe acting as someone who has some personal stake in it, but by removing the, the very vibrant and effective curriculum, academic culture, uh, group of scholars who are kind of self-governing and absorbing them into this much larger 
R1 university, uh, they've destroyed, I think, a very precious culture and a very precious, what we would call living learning community. And, and I think, again, it's a, again, in the interest of uh, outwardly saving money and increasing access to liberal arts education, uh, they've actually, I think, taken a couple of steps backwards because both the University Scholars Program and Yale and US, by virtue of being small and independent, we're able to attain, I think, a level of excellence in liberal arts education that'll be much harder for this larger centrally controlled entity to try to achieve. Well, let me, you know, let's go to Karen, but I wanted to say that I'm kind of curious about whether, you know, is this a purely institutional decision or does it reflect the larger political milieu in Singapore? At least uh, before this event, there were a couple of, of uh, things that happened that brought up questions about academic freedom and the curriculum there and what the Singaporean government or ministry thought was appropriate or not appropriate. And please recall that, uh, you know, if you want to protest anything in, in uh, Singapore, you have to go to a single spot in a park <laughs> in town, downtown. And then if you were an international student, you are not allowed to participate in any protest at all. So that gives you a sense of kind of uh, the control factors and concerns of the Singaporean government. But Karen, do you, is, does it relate to a larger issue uh, or do you think it's just simply a management decision by NUS? I mean, sure. I think Brian gave um, a pretty good overview. I do think there are there were management, just you know, new leadership issues. I think that there were there was some sense about these academic freedom questions and what does it mean to have kind of Yale and US be a bit of an island within the the Singaporean system that was um, part of, but but also somewhat separate. Um, but I think it's important to think about the context in which both. Um, the NUS leaders, because as Brian said, it was a very unilateral decision. You know, this is taken aback, I think, by it. Um, the way they and, the, and then the Singaporean Ministry of, of Education kind of framed it, which was, um, I mean, they did have some financial concerns and that was certainly part of the conversation. But a lot of the framing was, we want, if, if we think that this experiment, the Yale and US experiment in the liberal arts and having a liberal arts that is kind of of the region and of the 21st century, if we think that that's valuable and we think what we've learned from Yale and US is good, then why should we keep it bottled up for a small group of people and a small group of students, half of whom as Brian noted are international. We want, to have this be more for Singaporeans and give opportunities to more Singaporeans. The other sort of sort of relevant framework to what we're talking about is when the, the Minister of, of Education went before the, the, um, the Singaporean Parliament, he was asked about um, kind of what, how people might look at, at Singapore if it had pulled out of this um, relationship with this very prominent um, international university. And he said, look, just because somebody comes in and we have the, a relationship doesn't mean that ultimately in the final um, sort of calculus, we should decide what is best for Singapore. And we should take good lessons from these things, but we should make something that is wholly of our own. And so the framework was very much, we want something Singaporean for Singaporeans. You think this has any uh, that's so that makes it more of a real internal management uh, decision, but also related to the national needs of the Singaporean first aspect to some degree as well. And that's a common theme we find uh, in other parts of like this question of are people being displaced or native, you know, or citizens being displaced by international students to all these and these what is a, you know, um, a sought after public good. But do you think there's any indicators here of trouble or other things? Uh, for other uh, branch campuses, uh, like you know, the we have uh, uh, in Shanghai and other places, you, does, does this mean anything, or is it just you know, or should they, it, you know, maybe it doesn't mean anything, but there is a pattern going on, and we may have some concerns about these branch campus uh, collaborative efforts. I'll, I'll uh, uh, why don't we go to you first, Karen, on that? Okay. Sure. Um, of course, but the Yale and U.S. would say, and Yale and U.S. wasn't a branch campus, that it was its own institution. But um, I, I raised this, this question in a piece I wrote for the Chronicle of Higher Education, and I think the answer was maybe. I do think that um, for a number of reasons, one of which is this sort of rising nationalism, I think it's causing um, 
it's kind of a, a different look at these kind of international education partnerships. And I think it's worth asking if the, the sort of traditional model where the Western institution, the Yale, is coming to, to be the giver in, in some ways, sort of missionary sort of sense, is um, sharing its knowledge that it's not necessarily an equal relationship. Is that being supplanted by um, a more equitable sort of partnership? And will that affect kind of the way that these, these institutions happen? Sure, I think that there's also some questions and let me just very quickly return to the China context, which I think is somewhat different than the, the Yale context, but China has some very important Western um, joint venture universities um, with places like NYU and um, Duke. And I think that there's some real questions about, again, at what point do, do these questions of, of academic freedom driven by nationalistic governments, do they make these relationships possibly untenable? Because these are places that have guarantees of academic freedom built into their, their contracts. And so um, that is really in some ways separate from Yale and US, which I don't think was mostly an academic freedom issue, but I think it's worth sort of asking what are the future sort of, what is the future look for these kind of international so related to that is this question of, well, what is the nature of international collaboration? So, of course, students and branch campuses are part of that, but research is a really big component of that. And we see this kind of tension growing uh, between autocratic governments, but also like in the U.S., you know, we've had a lot of discussion and in the EU about intellectual property theft and what, you know, modes of uh, protection should, well, what kind of relationship should universities have and American universities have with China? And this is an ongoing political debate. Some of it's rhetoric, but it's, uh, it, you know, there's an issue there going on. But really briefly, maybe you could say uh, uh, anything you wanted to say, uh, Brian, about whether yeah, the U.S. means something, but kind of brief, because I want to go to another question. Good. Yeah, I mean, I think Karen did a great job summarizing. I, I, it does question the nature of a partnership, and it does place a greater burden on any partnership to be truly reciprocal. And it, it, in a way, it's sort of like a post-post-colonial moment in that we're no longer going to export higher ed. We have to sort of reformulate how we're approaching in these partnerships, where in this case, we being the US, how we can genuinely make it something that all the various stakeholders within the nation are truly engaged and truly participating with and, and re reassess that on a regular basis. And I think the early days of these partnerships was more just kind of an export model and I think that has to be refined and sort of reinvented a bit in, in this context. And often so involving a lot of money uh, uh, because yeah. the, those who wanted to build their higher ed systems often were providing subsidies that mm -hmm. were quite substantial, often to private institutions more than publics, and you couldn't find out what that was. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there's a business model things going on there. And now I want to make a transition. And we had a couple of questions, and this these are these are good ones. And I'll go to Igor first. And that's the question of, well, you know, uh, you know, how is our autocrats affecting the research productivity of institutions, like in STEM fields mostly? I mean, and we have to think, you know, in Europe perhaps different in the United States, different, but, you know, uh, science and technology are the major components of Chinese universities. You know, that's, that's where most of the enrollment program growth is and all of that. And so in any case, back to this question, you know, is it having an effect on the quality of STEM research more or less? And does it matter whether there's academic freedom or not? So Russia is a little different. They're all different. This gets back to how much nuance and, uh, you know, historical cultural differences there are. But uh, Igor, are you first on this? How's, how's it affecting the quality of research, if at all, uh, in the STEM fields in Russia? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I think it's kind of a double-edged sword to some extent. Uh, Soviet Union has historically had um, strong areas of research that were somehow connected to the military. Uh, and like in physics, for example, nuclear physics, um, um, other areas like uh, some certain areas of engineering. So these were the areas that were well funded and to some extent protected, but also, you know, a, a, as long as there are kind of a military implications. And, um, and now it's, I think, pretty much the same kind of a continued point uh, for resovitization argument that we were trying to make in our chapter. But also at the same time, 
there is much more control in these areas than in the past. And the indicator of that is that there were a few recent arrests of like physicists uh, that were working on a particular kind of a component of, um, um, of like a military equipment uh, that were uh, charged with kind of a espionage. Uh, and, and that kind of a, also a strong signal to uh, everyone working in this area is that, you know, international collaboration of any kind could be seen at a certain point as something very undesirable. And um, so we both, on one hand, there are more support. On the other hand, uh, uh, there, is, there are more risks uh, associated with uh, international collaborations. And uh, as we know, research is global in a way, and this collaborations are, are valuable. Uh, so it's kind of, um, again, as I said, you know, double-edged sword. Well, you know, uh, I noticed in the paper that Mr. Putin is now starting to talk about climate change and making it okay to talk about because that was also kind of part of the, you know, it is never, China's a little different, obviously, but uh, uh, you know, not interested in hearing about or promoting research on climate change in Russia. Uh, I go to uh, Karen on this, you know, that's, I think, an issue. One is that, uh, the, you know, international collaboration has been a really important component of uh, scientific, scientific progress and knowledge production. And I think, you know, we could look at COVID as a great example on uh, the development of vaccines, which were based on a lot of public investment and research. Uh, so international collaboration, sharing of data is really, really important in science. But that said, another question related to it is, you know, and perhaps is there funding for STEM research that is, you know, somewhat, uh, let's say, politically correct in, in, in China that says, I don't, well, we don't really want to have in-depth studies about, say, uh, promoted by our universities about pollution. I, I don't really know if that's true, uh, but it, uh, what's your sense about what the effect is on the quality of uh, research in STEM fields? Um, I mean, I guess I would just tick off a couple of things. Yes, I think what you're getting at is sort of right that before there was sort of this, if you, you know, that the, the issues of academic freedom are much more likely to intrude on um, the social sciences, on a law, those kinds of areas, and they are intruding more on science and technology. At the same time, China is investing um, quite a bit in, in those areas. It has become a national leader. And um, it is using, in some ways, um, uh, you can see kind of the intersection of, of this sort of neo-nationalism um, in science, in its investment, in its efforts to um, attract back, um, you know, uh, some of its sort of top um, scholars and scientists who left um, through its talent programs. Um, but I would also say, and this is a, a theme in, in the chapter, is that in some ways for China in particular, Chinese brand of neo nationalism is um, caught up also in these sort of neo-nationalist movements elsewhere in the world, not the least here in the US. And so while science still is, is less caught up in the politics than the social sciences in China, here in the US, it's the science actually that um, the American government and the Ch Chinese science that the American government is most um, wary of. And so it's almost the international interest sort of an intersection of, of these kind of um, impulses that is, um, is possibly one of the most important areas to watch. Brian, do you have any, a quick comment on any of this? Well, yeah, I've been wrestling with the, whether or not you can think of science and technology as neutral on this. And I, I think the answer is no, because I think really for top flight people and to be creative, they can't be managed with a level of control that seems to be required in some of these cases. And, and also in the case of the nationalism in these countries, by restricting the number of in international people of, of highest caliber, you are necessarily gonna erode the quality of the type of science, the type of technology that's being developed. We really, I think the real loss here is less that of political autonomy and, and freedom of speech in these cases, but really an erosion of, of a global talent pool that creating these barriers for movement of students and, and free exchange of ideas 
will only compromise the quality of all of our universities. And I think that's something to really take note of here, that it's a setback both in China and globally to not have this free exchange of people, ideas, faculty. And without a sense of freedom and, and open inquiry, that type of free, free exchange of talent will, can't happen especially when nationalistic agendas are sort of stocking different universities with not necessarily quotas, but you know, preferential hiring of their own nationals over uh, foreign talent. Well, you know, I just uh, related to China, uh, you know, this has been this kind of pattern of uh, a significant international exchange, uh, but also kind of a, uh, we're going to learn from others, but then we're going to build our own and create an insular world. You know, I mean, they're creating insular cryptocurrency. They're <laughs> looking to uh, uh, the, Cal the Chinese dream is partly about self-sufficiency uh, and that China is a great power that shouldn't be relied on other parts. Of the world. It's a tension of what Karen brought up about globalization and its interchange. But I, I still have that sense that China is becoming more insular and won't look uh, uh, outside uh, to Western uh, uh, nations as much. They're building their own relationships and that's part of the soft power approach of the Belt and Road system. But it, Karen, do you think, is it uh, really quickly, and then I got one more question to end up, end up here uh, this, this session, but do you sense that like, do they value that international, that the, the government and she and the, uh, the leadership of the party or are they really moving towards an insular world within their own kind of sphere of influence? Yes and no. They certainly see uh, educational and scientific diplomacy as an important tool. They are looking to build relationships, as you suggested, with, with the Belt and Road in, in places that they um, maybe traditionally did not. And so, you know, you're seeing a lot of um, student movement. So China is obviously the, the biggest exporter of students, but also it's a huge importer of, of students now um, coming from, um, from Africa, uh, from elsewhere in Asia. And so I think they're seeing that as an important tool. But I do think that there is the understanding that science is global. And so there's a limit um, on how insular um, they can be. And frankly, those people at universities here in the US and, and the American government should not want them to be too insular either because in some of these STEM areas, it is no longer possible to do good science without being connected to China. Okay, so the final question here, we only got a couple of minutes left. And that is, uh, you know, what, what should countries like the United States or let, let's say Western democracies if we are concerned about civil liberties and academic freedom, and we have various NGOs and things that monitor this, uh, scholars at risk, Freedom House, things of that nature, which are very important players in monitoring and promoting solutions to some degree. But what is it that we should be doing to help uh, preserve academic freedom or uh, some of the values that we find important in Western democracies in uh, in China, uh, their universities, particular or Russia. Let's start. Let's start with Russia. Is there anything we should be doing? That's um, that's a very difficult question. I think there is no silver bullet that can be done. You know, to reverse the course. Um, I would say creating more opportunities to continue dialogue, continue collaborations. Um, creating opportunities for like scholars at risk. And um, that, that could be uh, an obvious, you know, way to, to, to support, um, you know, Russian academics and in, in, in other in this area. Uh, but, but again, it's not, it's not an easy solution. Like there's no, there's no easy solution. There's no like uh, very simple solutions and um, they will they will be different in different countries, I guess, as well, and even in the different disciplines. So, yeah, that's that's a very good one. I'm, I'm, I'm I'd like to hear more from others. <laughs> well, it's a challenging question, believe you yeah. me. <laughs> I didn't mean. Uh, so, what what do you think about Hong Kong in particular? What you know, what things should uh, uh, we be doing to help uh, scholars or higher ed in uh, in in Hong Kong? Well, I, I do think that the Chinese authorities and the mainland have to be reminded 
of how valuable an asset it is for them to have this platform in Hong Kong for not only trade, but for the exchange of ideas. And I, I think all of these nations need to be reminded that it's really in their own interest to tolerate the complexities and messiness of these freewheeling academic campuses for the sake of contributing globally toward advances in science, technology, other fields, which we can only really do if we have a more cooperative and more open framework for exchange of people and ideas. So I suppose maintaining partnerships with Hong Kong universities, but also stressing to the universities how valuable those cooperative agreements are for, for them, for their region, and, and maybe making sure that, that those benefits are clearly communicated throughout, that it's not kind of one party at the expense of another, but that everyone is gaining from this greater scale of intellectual trade, if you will. It's sort of like free trade produces more efficiencies and a better economy. And here we're seeing the sort of shutdown and nationalizing of academic trade. And I think it only in the long run will, will set our civilization backwards to be sort of in these national enclaves again. Well, in the book, I do say, uh, you know, that universities and some of the authors also outline ways in which universities can be greater engaged with the public to help us understand the importance of international relations. There are the relationships between universities, between universities in different parts of the world, the kind of exchanges. What about the at the government level? Let's look at the U.S., for example. What is it that uh, the Biden administration might do in relationship to uh, uh, Chinese universities. Do you have any uh, thoughts on that, Karen? Final thoughts? Um, yeah, I'll be very quick. I know we're running down on time. Um, it's sort of what they should, it's more of what they should not do. Um, I think one of the legacies of the, the Trump administration was really to, to sort of a step back on, on these kind of higher education partnerships. The, the collaborations were flourishing um, in recent years between American and, and Chinese universities. I mean, the majority of American universities called China their most important partner. Um, yet the Trump administration cut off um, the Fulbright program and also the Peace Corps, so the sort of signature educational exchanges, um, things like the China Initiative, the um, investigation of Chinese um, and Chinese American scientists has sort of set a chilling relationship or sort of chill over the, the scientific relationship. Um, there are some visa issues that um, may, may have some legitimacy, but um, the perceptions of those is that um, they, uh, there's sort of the Chinese uh, graduate students are become, have become less welcome here in the U.S. Thus far, the Biden administration has not significantly changed any of those policies. And so I think one is looking for a reset on, if, if there will be a reset on, on policy towards um, China in the higher education space. But more broadly, the Biden administration has also said that it wants to have kind of more of a um, a renewed commitment to international education in the broad sense, and to what extent does that em embrace um, places like China and Chinese higher education? All right. Well, thank you so much. This was really great. We could only touch on issues kind of quickly. We had really good questions. Can't get to them all. We <laughs> tried to combine some, but uh, we had an engaged audience. Again, I want to note to you that the book is available for free. Can I get that? It's hard to do that. Oh, for free. Uh, through Project Muse, so that's uh, an event, uh, which is uh, the Johns Hopkins University Press uh, moniker. So please go and take.